thoughts and prayers are with the bereaved families affected. On the floor, this is one of the family members. She's been shot to the floor and she can't move. These movements are consistent with deliberate action by someone on the plane. The operation has entered a new phase. The search was already a highly complex multinational effort and it has now become even more difficult. My emotion is going through a roller coaster ride. With no news of the missing plane, the situation is becoming desperate. The waiting families are utterly broken. This program will ask whether the authorities are now losing control of the investigation as the world is getting impatient for answers. And we will look at the personal stories behind some of the 239 people on board MH370. 239 lives and one plane that have seemingly just vanished. Rescue teams from 25 countries are now involved in the search for the missing plane. Dozens of aircraft and ships are scouring the ocean for a sign, a clue, anything. What we're doing is producing our best estimate of the most likely place to search. Um, but I would hasten to add, it, it is far from very precise. The operation initially centred around the last known location of the aircraft. Flight MH370 took off from Kuala Lumpur Airport, bound for Beijing, on Saturday the 8th of March at 12.41 a.m. local time. The last transmission from the plane's onboard communication system, ACARS, was previously said to be at seven minutes past one. We've now learnt that it could have been switched off up to 30 minutes later. It has also been revealed that the last verbal contact from the plane to air traffic control was at 19 minutes past one, 11 minutes earlier than previously said. And it has emerged for the first time as well that the last words from the cockpit were spoken by the co-pilot before the plane's transponder, which tracks it, was turned off. At 1.30 a.m., air traffic control in Kuala Lumpur spoke to the flight deck. We've handed you over to Ho Chi Minh Air Traffic Control, was the message. OK, received, good night, was the reply. It was the last anyone heard of them. The part of this accident that surprises me most is the point of the turn, of the 120-degree turn back. I mean, that... What was the reason for that? Because that initiated everything that happened after that. Whatever reason they turned is the reason of the accident. How difficult is your task? Uh, very difficult. And whatever, we never give up. We try to search. Whatever the fate of flight MH370, the pilots will have played some role. 53-year-old Zahari Ahmed Shah was the captain that evening. He is a vastly experienced pilot with more than 18,500 flying hours under his belt. He was a volunteer in the community program that I organised. Uh, at the end of the program, uh, there was this guy helping to stack chairs to clean up the place and not having met him before, I asked who is this man and I was told he works for Malaysian Airlines. I went to say thank you to him and he introduced himself. 
giving me his name card and when I saw he was a, a captain of a 777, uh, you know, that's the kind of uh, humble person that Captain Zahari is. Captain Zahari's family have now made and released this video asking for him to come home to them soon. He was hired by Malaysia Airlines directly out of school and uh, trained by Malaysia Airlines. Um, he was one of the original 777 fleet captains. Um, you know, he's a great guy, you know, just a great pilot. You know, I think it attests to his experience. It was 18,000 hours of flying, great career. The first officer was Farik Abdul Hamid. He's 27 years old and joined Malaysia Airlines in 2007. He was fairly new to this model of aircraft, a Boeing 777-200. Initial investigation uh, indicated it was the co-pilot uh, who, who basically spoke the last time uh, it was recorded on tape. CCTV shows the two men going through security on their way to board the flight that evening. We are told they did not specifically request to fly together that night. Police have started searching their homes, talking to friends and neighbors. This is Captain Zahari's house on a smart compound on the outskirts of Kuala Lumpur. His maid looks out at the door. It's hard to believe that he would have uh, been uh, to, to do anything like that, you know, or to, you know, like the speculation of pilot suicide or a pilot hijacking. I just can't imagine his, with his character and what we knew of him, he, it just wouldn't make any sense that he would have anything to do with any sort of uh, deliberate action on his part. They found this simulator in Captain Zahari's house. Investigators say that some data on it was recently deleted. Local and international expertise have been recruited to examine the pilot's fight simulator. Some data has been deleted from the simulator and forensic work to retrieve this data is ongoing. I would like to take this opportunity to state that the passengers, the pilots and the crew remain innocent until proven otherwise. My emotion is going through what I call a roller coaster ride. When you hear of a, a potential uh, answer, a positive answer, it goes up and then there's no, it goes back down and goes up and goes down. And yeah, it's difficult and I can just sympathize with the families of, of the people involved now because they must be going through much, much more difficult times. His piloting skills would be great, you know, and, and I think he would do anything he could to preserve the lives of the, his passengers and, and the cargo, the property of Malaysia Airlines. Uh, he was really proud of that company and um, but the captain and co-pilot are not the only people who are on the plane to have come under investigation. Early on, two names stood out, an Austrian called Christian Kozel, the other an Italian called Luigi Moraldi. They shouldn't have been listed on the plane's manifest. They weren't on board. Their passports had been stolen in Thailand. It would appear that they had then been used by these two men, Puri Noor Mohammadi and Delavar Saeed Mohammed Reza, Iranians trying to claim asylum in Europe, but they have no known links to terrorism. We have the CSI effect. We expect we're going to have the answers to this mystery uh, within, uh, within an hour's episode. I, I think that's, that's unrealistic. We're dealing with different cultures. We're dealing with different capacities in terms of the investigatory powers and capabilities of some of these countries, with, with all due respect. Um, so I think it, it may take longer than we expect. Inevitably, after all of this time, and with no clue as to where the plane is, the Malaysian investigators are coming under scrutiny. 
They hold daily news conferences, but with no explanation. The frustration on all sides is growing. In Beijing, some relatives have threatened to go on hunger strike if they don't get more information. If the families had spoken to, had been allowed to speak to uh, senior officials from the Malaysian government, I think they would have felt a little bit more reassured. Obviously, you can't imagine what they must be going through now. Um, but if there was a, a, a dedicated team to look after their needs, including psychologists if necessary, uh, and just to um, give a timely flow of information, whatever was possible, and to make sure their needs are tended to on the ground. A former Malaysian transport minister has told Sky News that an international body should now take over the investigation. The UN sanctioned ICAO, ICAO stands for, is an acronym for International Civil Aviation Organization. And they do have their, uh, their, own, and their own independent uh, prop, independent uh, investigation into any catastrophe of this nature. And uh, maybe, I think it's good to trigger this, uh, initi uh, this uh, investigation so that, uh, so that nobody would ever say that, uh, you know, uh, certain parties have something to uh, withhold. But people are starting to openly question the investigation now. Relatives are beginning to believe that the truth is being withheld from them. Next, those frustrations boil over, and we look at who else was on board the flight. We are now starting to learn about the personal stories behind the 227 missing passengers and 12 crew members. Our thoughts and prayers are with the bereaved families affected. On the floor, this is one of the family members. She's been shot to the floor and she can't move. These movements are consistent with deliberate action by someone on the plane. The operation has entered a new phase. The search was already a highly complex multinational effort and it has now become even more difficult. My emotion is going through the roller coaster ride. <laughs> Tempers are fraying. Some relatives of missing passengers were forcefully removed from a news conference in a Kuala Lumpur hotel. The scenes were undignified. An inquiry has been launched. Let's go! As the days go by without sign of the plane or a clue as to its whereabouts, the uncertainty is becoming unbearable for the waiting families. And we are also learning more about their loved ones, the personal stories of flight MH370. The youngest passenger on board was two years old, the oldest, 76. Seven of them are children yet to reach their fifth birthdays. Twenty-six-year-old Yu Wen Chao is originally from Mongolia. He moved to study business at Hull University in England. He went back to see his girlfriend. Muktesh Mukherjee and his wife Chao Mao Bai had been on a beach holiday together in Vietnam. Their two young sons are waiting for them at home in Beijing. Could the manifest hold the answers? Investigators are scrutinising every name on it. They say, remarkably, they still haven't received details for each passenger after all of this time. The passenger manifest is obviously very important. It enables you to identify all the persons that are on board the aircraft, and that obviously is important for the security of the aircraft. But the Chinese authorities insist they have done their bit. 
China has investigated the backgrounds of all Chinese passengers on board the missing Malaysia Airlines flight MH370 and has found no evidence suggesting they are linked to destructive behavior on the aircraft. So we can rule out the suspicion that Chinese passengers are linked to a terror attack or destructive activities on the missing plane. Fifteen different nationalities were flying to Beijing that night. Among them, 153 from China, 38 from Malaysia, five Indians, four French, three from the United States, and two Iranians on board who became initial suspects but seemed to have been ruled out. 35-year-old Zhu Kun is a stuntman who is due to start work on a new series of Netflix in Malaysia next week. He was on his way to Beijing to see his two young children. Bob and Kathy Lawton are from Springfield Lakes in Australia. They have three daughters and are described as doting grandparents. Salmat bin Omar has been waiting at a Kuala Lumpur hotel for any news. His son is an aviation engineer. He was on his way back to Beijing to repair private jets. Because he has obvious knowledge of aircraft, he too is now under suspicion. When the news came about, it broke my heart because the aircraft was lost. It didn't fall, it didn't crash, it just disappeared. Yes, I understand, and we do hope that the investigators do investigate. In my opinion, all I know is that my son is an engineer for private jets and not huge Boeing planes. Standing by, ready to be called in, is an American team with the technology and expertise to search the seabed. They can deploy two underwater drones as deep as 6,000 meters. They work in tandem, scanning the floor in a lawnmower pattern, 10 meters one way, 10 meters back. It will go down a row, uh, it will turn and come back down again uh, on the other side. What, it, what it's doing is, is the, the side scan is running and it looks out and is getting returns back from primarily hard objects that are, that are on the bottom. All the rows in, in, the, in the mission are uh, put together and in, in created a mosaic and you can look at that and, and get an overall uh, view of, of the bottom and what, what is there. These underwater drones were used in the search for the wreckage of Air France 447, which crashed off the coast of Brazil in 2009. Even with a rough location to work in, finding it took some time though, well over a year. This scan eventually led them to it. But the teams need to know where to go, where to search. If the plane has crashed, its black box will only emit a signal for a few weeks more. Time is running out. It's possible that uh, we'll never find out what happened. I think there just are so many unknowns right now. Uh, the issue of the plane just flying you know, without any or almost minimal tracking for a long period of time. You know, we need some more information. With so little news as to the plane's whereabouts, the relationship between passengers and officials is getting worse by the day. They've been avoiding their responsibilities and talking nonsense. There are a lot of contradictory answers to our questions. That makes us very angry. I'm angry that the Malaysians don't tell the truth. They lie to the whole world. I'm totally frustrated about this. Where is my son? Even taxis have GPS. They can be found if they are lost or stolen. It's a huge plane, so high-tech and so advanced. How could it not be found? It's a joke. Paul Weeks is a mechanical engineer. He accidentally left his wedding ring and watch behind at home when he travelled to Mongolia for work. Hadrian Watrolos on the right is 17, Chao Yan on the left, 18. Together, they are on their way to school in Beijing.
and 34-year-old Hu Chao Ning was on his way home with his three-year-old daughter, Hu Si Wan. There are 239 people missing, lost on flight MH370. These are the stories of just some of them. <laughs>